we're going to look at modeling mechanical systems in the frequency domain. So, a couple things that we can say about our analyses. First of all, they deal with three passive components. <coughs> We've got the spring, the damper, and the mass. And here are the equations relating the force to the position. You can see for the spring, force is uh, displacement is proportional to force by the stiffness k. The damper, the force is proportional to the velocity, and that's the damping ratio c. And for the mass, the force is proportional to the acceleration uh, related to that by the mass. And for these analyses, we're going to use Newton, Newton's second law of motion to get our differential equations. So once we have differential equations, then we take the Laplace transform. Again, we're assuming zero initial conditions, and that will give us the transfer function. So in general, the process is as follows. We're going to assume a positive direction for our displacement. Then we'll draw a free body diagram and use Newton's second law to form differential equation. So Newton's second law says that the sum of the forces is equal to the product of the mass and acceleration. And then once we have our differential equation, we assume zero initial conditions and take the Laplace transform, rearrange that to get the transfer function. So here is an example. We have this system, uh, ground, a spring, a mass, and a damper, and we want to find the transfer function. The Laplace transform of the displacement related to the Laplace transform of the input force, F. Okay. So we already have, we'll just go through the steps here. Assume a positive direction, that's done for us. You can see X is assumed to be positive to the right. And we assume that X is zero when the spring is unstretched. Now we need to draw a free body diagram. So we'll draw this body and all the forces that are acting on it. So there is our mass M. And we have, so we will assume a displacement in the positive direction. So that means that the spring would be pulling on it. So that's K times X1. That's the amount of force from the spring and then the damper would be pulling on it and the amount of that force is the damper times the velocity and then we had the applied force F of T. Okay, so there's the free body diagram and now the next step was to use Newton's second law to form a differential equation. So we have here the sum of the forces, we've got negative KX1 minus c x dot 1, and so the sign here comes from our assumed positive direction to the right, it's plus f of t, and that is all equal to mass, I should really just call this f, because x is also a function of time, so just to make this consistent. Anyway, those forces add up to mass times x1 double dot, so the acceleration. And I think I also didn't need to call this x1, it's just x. x1 would be if we had more bodies that could move independently. We'll get to that later. Okay, so here's our equation of motion. And now we'll go back to our steps here. And so we have our equation of motion. Now we need to take the Laplace transform. And... So we end up with negative k times x. Again, I'm dropping the one subscript because in the figure it's just x. It's not x1. And minus csx plus f is equal to ms squared x. Rearrange this to get the transfer function. So g is equal to x over f. And so that is equal to... one over ms squared plus cs plus k. So there is our transfer function <coughs> for this spring mass damper system. And there it is then. And um, in the book, so 
it uses this f of v, which maybe I should adopt. C is more common, but anyway, if we're going to be using the figures out of the book, FV is what I have written as C, the damping ratio, a damping coefficient. So that just walked through the steps here, positive direction, free body diagram, Newton's second law, Laplace transform, and rearranging to get the transfer function. Now, more complicated systems have independent motions or multiple degrees of freedom. So multiple independent motions. Um, and that means that they have points that can move even if the other points are held fixed. So for these systems we need a number of equations of motion equal to the number of independent motions. So if we have a system with these multiple degrees of freedom, the process is similar. We need to assume positive directions for all the displacements, then draw the free body diagrams. And for each free body diagram, we need to treat each independent motion separately. And we use the principle of superposition for these linear systems. So what that means is we will draw all the forces acting on the point, assuming it's moving and every other point is fixed. And then we'll draw the forces that would result if that the point in question is fixed and all the other points are moving. So this will become clearer with an example. <coughs> Once we have our equations of motion, we're back on the same track as before. Or I'm sorry, once we have our free body diagrams, then we use Newton's law to form differential equations, then we take Laplace transform and rearrange it to get the transfer function. So here is an example. We have two degrees of freedom here. X1 and X2 are independent motions. So you can see that if we held X2 fixed, then X1 could still move. And also if we held X1 fixed, then X2 could still move. So x1 and x2 are independent. And we want to find here the transfer function relating x2 to the force f. So our process is to assume positive directions. We already have that given to us. x1 and x2 are just positive to the right. Then draw the free body diagrams. And here we'll talk about using that pr principle of superposition. So free body diagrams for this system. Let's see, here is M1, and we have a spring uh, coefficient of friction here. We also have some damping here and another spring. So we've got two dampers and two springs. So there's a force here, and that would be, and now we're just, we're assuming that mass 1 is moving and, and mass 2 is fixed. So we're drawing the forces as if mass 2 was fixed and mass 1 was moving. So we've got K1 X1 acting to the left and then we have I'm going to call it hmm I want to call it C1 because that is more common even though in the picture it's FV1 And acting to the left also, we have C1, X1 dot. And then X M1 is moving to the right and M2 is fixed. So we have a force from K2 pushing it back. And we have a force from this damper pushing it back also. So we have, I think that's C C3. C3, X1 dot, K2, X1. Okay. So those are the f um, forces. And let me also add the applied force here, F. So these are the forces, these four, assuming M1 is moving and M2 is fixed. And now we need to add the forces to our free body diagram, assuming M1 is fixed and M2 is moving. So if M2 is moving to the right, then we'll have a force pulling from K2 and a force pulling from this damper 3. So that would look like K2, X2, and C2, X2 dot. So there's our free body diagram for body 1. 
and we just need to repeat that for every other body in our system or every other independent motion. So this next independent motion occurs at mass 2 and we're first going to draw the forces assuming mass 2 is fixed, mass 1 is moving, I'm sorry, mass 1 is fixed, mass 2 is moving. So mass 2 is moving, we got a force from K3, C2, K2, and C3. So mass 2 is moving to the right, so C2 will impede that motion, and the force magnitude is C2X2 dot. And we have K3X2, and we have C3X2 dot, and K2X2. Okay. So those four forces are assuming M1 is fixed and M2 is moving. <coughs> and now we'll add the forces to our free body diagram assuming M2 is not moving and M1 is moving in the positive direction. So that would give us K2X1 C3X1 dot. So now our free body diagrams are complete. We have two independent motions, so that means we'll have two equations of motion. So we need to apply Newton's second law twice, once for each of these bodies, or each of these uh, independent motions. So we'll start with this one. So we have F minus KX1 minus C1X1 dot minus C3X1 dot minus K2X1 plus K2X2 plus C2X2 dot. That's all the forces acting on it, and that is equal to M1X1 double dot. And the equations for our second motion here, we have K2X1 plus C3X1 dot minus K2X2 minus C3X2 dot minus C2X2 dot minus K3X2. So that's all the forces. That's equal to M2X2 double dot. So we have... <coughs> Assume positive directions, draw the free body diagrams, use Newton's law to form differential equations. Now we need to take Laplace transform and rearrange to get the transfer function. So we'll take the Laplace transform with this first. F minus K X1 minus C1 S X1 minus C3 S X1 minus K2 X1 plus K2X2 plus C2SX2 equals M1S squared X1. Take the Laplace transform of the second equation. K2X1 plus C3SX1 minus K2X2 minus C3SX2 minus c 2 S X2 minus K3 X2 is equal to M2 S squared X2. Now we will rearrange these and get the transfer function. So we're going to put this in matrix form. <coughs> Again, we'll have AX equals Y. So we want to group all the X1 terms and all the X2 terms. So this first equation we ended up with M1S squared plus M1S squared plus let's see we have C1 and C3 okay C1 plus C3 S plus, and then we have, this should be K1, K1, K2, K1 plus K2. 
So those are all the x1 terms in the first equation. And then we have the x2 terms. So negative C2S plus K2. And that's multiplied by the vector x1 and x2. And that is equal to well, plus transform of the force, the applied force. Okay, so doing the matrix multiplication, we end up with this first equation. So now we'll do the same thing for these other terms, or for the second equation. So we end up with negative, these are the x1 terms, C3S plus K2, and then the x2 terms m2s squared plus c3 and c2 c2 plus c3s plus and then the k's we have k3 and k2 k2 plus k3 and that's equal to zero So we want to solve for x2. So we can use, and we'll call this, this is a, and this is x, and this is y. So we use Kramer's rule. To solve for x2. All right, so x2 is equal to the determinant of m1s squared plus c1 plus c3s plus k1 plus k2. Basically, this column and this column. We'll make a matrix of that, 2 by 2. Negative c3s plus k2. And then we're going to replace this column in the A matrix with uh, this vector. So f. Zero. So that determinant divided by the determinant of A. And I'm not going to bother writing all that out. Uh, that would just take up too much of your time. So determinant of A. And this is equal to, so that's zero, and we have uh, F times C3S plus K2 divided by the determinant of A. So there we can get our transfer function, X2 over F, which is what we wanted. So we get x2 over f is c3s plus k2 and just for completeness, go ahead and write the determinant of a. Hopefully there will be room. This t term times this term um, minus this term times this term. So this is the denominator continued minus C2S plus K2 times C3S plus K2. This doesn't seem right. Um, we have C3 and C3. So this should be C3. I wrote that wrong. Because we have here, this is the X2 term. C2S. Hmm. Hmm. Something wrong. Should be C3, not C2. Okay, so this right here was wrong. This should be C3. And this should be C3. Okay, so it was right for this free body diagram, but this free body diagram is wrong. So that's C3, and then this is C3, and this is C3, so this is C3. Okay, so there's the transfer function. 
but the process is free body diagram, equations of motion, Laplace transform, and then rearrange and solve for the transfer function. So mistakes can be made in this part, but the most important part, conceptually, is the free body diagrams and the principle of superposition that is uh, generating the equations of motion, assuming one point is held fixed while the other moves, and then holding that first point fixed and letting the other one move. So, now, moving on. Again, we can use the concept of impedance. Here it's mechanical impedance. And this is defined as the transfer function relating the displacement to the force. So for a spring, the impedance is K. For a damper, the impedance is Cs. And for a mass, the impedance is Ms squared. So let's look again at this example that we just did uh, using impedances. Well, we'll look at both examples. So <coughs> for the first example, we see the Laplace transform of the force, Laplace transform of the displacement, and then the impedances for the spring, the mass, and the, I'm sorry, the spring, the mass, and the damper. So here are the, here's the sum of the impedances. And we can see the impedances showing up again in the second, also in the second example. So all these terms here, we have the force, the displacement, and then the coefficients are just the imp different impedances. And so if we look at it in matrix form, just because it's cleaner, so we've got the sum of these impedances. We've got just a bunch of impedance terms. Okay. So what we can recognize if we look at this, is we have the same pattern that we saw whenever we had multiple loops in electrical circuits. And the way it applies here for these mechanical systems is we would have this equation, or this system of equations. So for an example where we have two independent motions, we'd have two equations. And what those are is we'd have the sum of the impedances connected to the motion at x1, and that sum is multiplied by the Laplace transform of x1. And from that product, we subtract th the product of the sum of the impedances between x1 and x2, and that's and uh, the Laplace transform of x2. And that difference is equal to the sum of the applied forces at x1. So some of the uh, impedances at x1, we've got impedance from this spring, impedance from this damping, impedance from this spring, impedance from this damping, and also impedance from the mass. So that's the s sum of impedances connected to the motion in x1. And then we multiply that by the Laplace transform x1, and the sum of impedances between x1 and x2. So between x1 and x2, we have impedance from this damper, and impedance from this spring. And if we look at our equation, here is the sum of the impedances connected to the motion at, M at x1. So the mass 1, that its impedance, the two dampers, their impedance, the two springs, their impedance, that's times x1. And then subtracted from that, we have the sum of the impedances shared between, or connecting x1 and x2. So we have C3 and K2, and that's multiplied by x2. And that's equal to the sum of the applied forces to x1. And then we just do the same thing uh, for this second line here. So <coughs> quickly, I will look at just blindly using this equation for our example. So we have the sum of the impedances, what's it say? Sum of the impedances connected to the motion at x1. So we've got, well, the motion at x1 has a mass. So mass has impedance, whoops. Mass has impedance m s squared, so m1 s squared. Motion at x1 has impedance, um, from two dampers, C1 and C3. So plus 
C1S plus C3S. And it also has impedances from springs, K1 and K2. Plus K1 plus K2. And so that's multiplied by X1 minus the sum of the impedances between X1 and X2. So we have C3 and K2 between X1 and X2. Minus C3S plus K2. And that's times X2. And that's equal to the sum of the applied forces, so F. And now we have minus the sum of the impedances between them. And it's the same as this term. So C3S plus K2 times X1 plus sum of the impedances connected to the motion at X1, at X2. So we had M2 is an impedance for the motion at X2. And then we have some dampers. So we had C2 and C3. C2, C3. So the impedance from the damper is C2 or CS. So we got C2S plus C3S. And then the springs. So we had K2 between the two masses and then K3 between mass 2 and the wall. And the sum of the applied forces on X2 is 0. So we end up with that same system of equations that we had in matrix form uh, when we went through this step by step, but we just generated it a lot more quickly um, using that shortcut. So the thing with shortcuts is they save time, but you can make mistakes if you don't apply it, mm, I guess, if you apply it without thinking about it a little bit. So here is the same shortcut that we can use whenever we have uh, mechanical systems with multiple degrees of freedom and we want to come up with the system of equations.